So, um, Alessandra uh, asked me to, uh, to moderate this panel. Uh, I will give you each of you a chance to introduce yourselves because there are lots of people uh, at Meetup who were not here, I think, earlier. Uh, we have some prepared questions, but I think it will be better to just open up the floor to the floor for, for questions. And if we get a run out of questions, I will ask you one of the prepared ones. Uh, so, with that, uh, please uh, could you take turns introducing yourselves and uh, what do you do? Okay. Welcome everyone. My name is Krzysztof. You can call me Chris. It's much easier because in Poland we tend to you know, put Y and Z in weird places and it's <laughs> make people confused. Um, I'm a data scientist with Brainly. Brainly is a company uh, that helps, that is, tries to help uh, children to learn new things. And uh, we are hoping to, to, to be a social learning platform that will make uh, acquiring new skills to children a lot, lot easier. Thank you. Um, so my name is Sergi. Um, I'm trying to, together with a company called Stylight, uh, based in Munich, Germany. We're trying to democratize fashion. So basically in one platform we have some more than 1,000 shops and um, we do different things, like starting with classifying those, making it a bit easier for users to discover and other things. And on the side, I also organize machine learning meetup also in Munich. So if you're interested, you can join us. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Soshko. I'm machine learning consultant for mostly for startups, mostly specializing in deep learning for NLP and Rexis. Whatever, working for anyone who pays, including <laughs> these guys who are working with Sergey on uh, uh, how is it called, World Food Program Accelerator last week, but they didn't pay. But food was awesome. Uh, so yeah, things like this. We were working with this next guy who introduced himself in Google for quite some time. Uh, we'll yeah. go for food. Yeah, we'll go for food. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Christian. Uh, I work now as a machine learning engineer for a startup in Palo Alto. That is uh, in the automotive area. Um, before I worked with Sasha and Google, and I'm yeah, I'm going to different events and, and teaching about like talking about TensorFlow, deep learning, and stuff like that. Okay, thanks. So then I will open the, the floor to questions. Anyone that has a question, please rise up, and I will make sure somehow that you get the mic. Anyone? I guess you can hear me. I recently. I recently read a statement on a social platform that there's no use to explain the technology of AI to the C-suite. What's your take on that? So this meant C-level managers? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. So from my point of view in the moment, um, so let me, okay, let me, let me be a bit more precise. Um, what we are talking about AI, it's narrow AI. Right? It's very dedicated stuff. We are not talking about a general AI. In the computer, there's nothing intelligent. Even AlphaGo, even Alpha Zero is not really intelligent. Right? Like it's, it's, it's written by very intelligent people to solve certain yeah, tasks. Yeah, to solve very intelligent problems. But no, I mean, it's, it's doing it good. There's really a lot of um, kind of thought is inside, years of development, right? There was a good uh, saying with AlphaGo, with Go being like the uh, hardest easy problem to solve. Um, well, Go is, Go is difficult, yeah, uh, so, somehow Go is difficult because of the, this incredible number of combinations that you have. And it's super difficult to write a, 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 a formula in a closed form that tells you how to solve Go. Uh, that's why it, it got solved basically with deep learning which is able to do a kind of approximation of the value function. And it does this approximation really good. And still AlphaGo or AlphaZero is learning from millions of games. So people do not learn from a million of games, right? Okay, long story, long story short. We have narrow uh, artificial intelligence. It's working quite well. Images, uh, self-driving car, I mean image recognition, self-driving cars, um, stuff like this. This is all like getting really into industry. It's really going into application. Um, I think what now is, has to come is business ideas. And that's why I would not say that don't teach AI to C-level managers. Teach, teach what AI can do to everyone. So uh, we need the next, like, let's say, killer app, the next like, really good uh, application to use. Because I think like, the field is kind of getting 
it's become major, right? Like, like it can be used now. So, um, that being said, do maybe do not teach the math of AI to the C-level manager, but give them an idea of what they can do with it. And I think we are, we will see in the next several years some really cool applications, right? And most probably it's not the AI researchers that, that think about the application. It's some people from business that will think about the application. Anyone else wants to add to the answer? Of course. <laughs> uh, so AI and machine learning is not some transcendent knowledge that is hard to understand really. If you have basic mathematical background, uh, like older methods for machine learning were much more complex and involved mathematically than deep learning, for example, right, Christian? Kind of. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I know quite a few people, especially in the technology sector, both see something else and investors who know quite a bit about machine learning. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that if um, if this is the area where your company can get a competitive advantage, uh, being a CEO or someone, you should really try to understand it. And again, it's not that hard. Uh, on the other hand, I'm seeing very often, uh, especially in like young startup founders, that uh, they have some idea, uh, we are doing X, and then we will throw in artificial intelligence and it will be the new like brave world of pink unicorns. Blockchain, don't forget blockchain. Yeah, it, it, it's the same with blockchain, right? It's a like distributed trust mechanism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but most of the people think it is crypto, and that's it. Uh, but I mean, first of all, it is not that hard to understand. Uh, second of all, uh, as with every bus term, for example, I don't know how many of you remember the agile hype, and before that, the object orientedness hype and what not, you know, uh, people not knowing how to write code, drawing UML diagrams on whiteboards. Uh, with every technology, there are people who know about this stuff, there are people who like to speak about this stuff. And uh, this is not the same set. Um, <laughs> so, I would encourage really everyone who is at the managerial positions, especially if your company is into technology, to try to learn about it and at least look at whether it is applicable or not. Um, and I would encourage the young potential founders of the startups to do pretty much the same. Yeah, like, I mean, after two speakers are already, like, hard to add, but I would say the same, basically. Um, I think like a good indicator if somebody is like talking about problem and what they're solving, they're actually solving that. If they're talking about AI, they're just aiming for investment, and that's like very common thing, right? Um, and I, I know like friends of mine who like recently also like closed like a big round, and they're not talking about AI, right? They're doing machine learning, they're doing it like quite actively in production scale, but they solve the problems like for the people. Um, if you're building a startup, most likely it's also good to understand what are you know borders, what you can push basically, and what is the state of the art right now. Um, but I think also state of the art and what you're going to use in production sometimes is like also be like quite far away. So um, don't try. Like in my understanding, it doesn't make sense to you know like print all fancy papers like from NIPS to you like C level and say like looks amazing like not going to help. But uh, try to build some prototype maybe with some you know like pre-trained models as Sashka was showing before and after just start from there basically. I have only one thing to ask. Uh, you have to educate C-level guys because they are paying your salary. <laughs> so first of all, they have to understand how useful the machine learning and AI can be and how they can use it to make more money. And I can give you one example from my experience. Um, some time ago I joined Philip Morris, the tobacco company as a second data scientist and a new brand new team. And I think like after a month or two, we went uh, for a presentation to the headquarters and in the room there were like six VPs. So this hour of their time was worth like um, two years of my salary. So it's like, it's not they don't want to learn, they want to know how they can exploit us. Okay. Thank you. Anyone? Hello?
my question would be related to research in AI. Uh, what do you think are the most uh, newest, the most emergent, and uh, maybe the most important areas in research for uh, the near future? Define near. <laughs> maybe let's say now. <laughs> Like even now, machine learning is too wide an area to to be able to tell everything. I can tell maybe a little bit about NLP. I can tell a few things about recommended systems. But overall, what I'm seeing now with this like latest and the greatest, and it's been like that for the next cup for, for the previous couple of years, unfortunately for many people, is that uh, the state of the art models become more and more complex which means that pretty much like with software I think that the age of the uh, lonely brave discoverers will be pretty much over soon uh, like if you take, as, as we discussed uh, with some of you today if you take one of the latest things in deep learning for NLP like ELMA embeddings or the transformer architecture or even the pretty old word to back, right? Uh, the successful approaches are bags of tricks and while for word to vec it was like five tricks involved uh, which made it like more efficient than anything back then with newer methods uh, like one of the guys who created uh, transform architecture told that no one from their team could probably recreate it from the scratch right no one from the team has this knowledge which means that innovation in at least mainstream machine learning will be more and more in the area of big and rich institutions rather than enthusiastic individuals who figured out how to train a model on a single GPU they have unfortunately for us which also means that maybe the, there will be the next wave of uh, new machine learning methods which will be uh, possible to attack by uh, an effort of a single guy in a single computer or whatever, I don't know, Google call-up but I don't think this uh, this will come as an evolution, there will be probably something absolutely new like uh, different than deep learning or whatever that we see now, but for now again most of the things that work efficiently both in, in research and in production they, they are becoming more complex. You can probably think about it as the uh, like 80s to 90s to 2000s evolution in software development. If you were back then involved into the IT scene, you probably remember this uh, uh, like guys who wrote software alone. You don't? They are too young. Okay, there were guys who were writing software alone, sharing at is a shareware or whatever, earning some money from it, starting some startups like almost from the scratch. Now it is long gone, despite the wide availability of APIs and whatever. So I think it will be pretty much the same with machine learning. Um, I would just like add a small one. Um, so I think on one hand I agree, and we can see it like from outer mile right when we just like just like a, uh, sending like a bunch of compute power right and try, trying to you know like build better neural networks right, and it's getting like more complex on one hand right. But on the other hand, um, there was like a very nice uh, blog post by Peter Verden from like Google TensorFlow as well, and like, he's saying that like future is tiny right because you can see right now. The number of like a tiny microcontrollers that are showing up that also having like a better CPU is getting like a bigger and bigger, and there are also some people who start to focus on how to deploy some like smaller machine learning on those like a smaller devices as well. Unfortunately, with all of us, you know, like cloud providers, whatever, like Google, Amazon, whoever you name it, they're not yet focusing on like tiny data, like how to make it like more efficiently. But I think with increased demand of those devices, right, and having this connectivity like everywhere. I hope that like in the next whatever number of years, it's hard to predict basically, but we will see something that is like more efficient to run on those devices um, from one perspective. From another perspective, amount of data is increasing, I mean it's like everybody's talking about that, that's obvious, but um, labeling this data is getting like even more expensive basically. So going in the direction of like active learning, when you know exactly what to label and like what subset of the data is missing basically, 
I think it's also going to be uh, one of the big uh, topics as well. Not even talking about the book. Okay, I'm just going to give it away. <laughs> no, I, um, I totally agree uh, uh, with Sergey that, that um, unsupervised learning. So uh, we have a lot of data. Labeling is expensive. If you can do something that can crunch uh, billions of, of uh, samples and doesn't need labels or super little labels, that is something super cool. Um, now the discussion, uh, th there was a really good uh, uh, paper uh, uh, by Google actually from a lot of people and they discussed that still uh, biological learning is really different because have a look, brains learn from much, much, much less samples, much less. And uh, look at, at let, let's say look at animals, uh, when a turtle hatches from the egg, uh, they, they know, for example, to run away from birds, right? Like the, the birds would eat them on the way to the, uh, you know, they hatch in, in, in the sand at the beach. Um, so apparently there's no, there's no back propagation training in, 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 in biological pr brains. Well, there are there are, yeah, but, but okay, so, so tell me how to get these priors, in, uh, priors inside. It's, uh, how are they encoded? Um, this is something I think you can uh, uh, learn on. Uh, I'm not completely believing in that only big companies can do cool research. You know the company Fast AI? They do really good courses, and basically those guys manage. There was the Dawn competition by by Stanford University. They asked uh, train ImageNet, train a train a ResNet 50 on ImageNet. So ImageNet is a super large data, kind of large data set, a million images. Uh, train it, but train it fast. Train it cheap, like uh, um, uh, fast meaning like uh, they, they made a competition, of course, how fast. Um, and of course, first Google was winning. 30 minutes with a TPU pod. TPU is a, a TPU is kind of a GPU. is 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 a super fast chip to do uh, uh, machine learning. It's much faster even than the GPU chip that you can buy. Uh, TPU so uh, and the TPU pod has several of those TPU chips. So it's it's something that basically only big companies have, and they manage to go to get it down to 30 minutes, right? Training training. Training ResNet on ImageNet like three, four years ago was weeks. So now Google got it down to 30 minutes. Fast AI, this is a company of a few dozen people or something like that. I don't know the numbers exactly, but it's, I think it's not more than 50. They got it down to 17 minutes without TPO. Just by cleverness. Um, yeah, by cleverness, using a lot of tricks. Well, this is more than 10 people, top researchers, Christian. I'm not <laughs> sure. No, no, they, 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 they read, read, the read the blog article. They used a lot of, uh, uh, actually, like, 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 like. Uh, yeah, but um, how, how much money does your company need to have in order to attract 10 researchers like this? This wasn't 10 researchers, these were 10 students that, that did that. Um, and they used, let, let me finish, man. Uh, they, used, they, used the techno, they used a technique that is called. Um, uh, um, it's called uh, yeah, um, super learning with cyclic learning rates. Where you use super super high learning rates for a certain moment of time, for a certain moment, uh, for a certain part of the training, which lets you con the models converge much much faster. So using all of these tricks, they were much faster. They did it with kind of like a much smaller budget than than Google. I don't think they put millions in this. These were mostly like enthusiasts. Look at fast AI, fast AI, fast like. Fast and AI like AI, okay? <laughs> uh, and they have a really interesting research uh, blog uh, where they detail really lots of different ideas. So I believe there's still some ideas. So of course there's always the danger that whatever comes, Google takes it. Ah, and, and the, the, the psychic learning rate, it was done, it was done by one or two guys from, I don't remember the name, actually from a naval, like from an army uh, uh, research facility in the US. So they experimented with it, and the paper was kind of overlooked for one or two years until someone dipped it out. And when you look at it now, also Google used, I think, kind of this psychic learning rates in, in, in some some of this. And by the by the way, TPU, this super super fast chip for for uh, training your your networks, <coughs> you can get it with Colab. Colab is this free kind of Jupyter notebook by Google, <laughs> and uh, maybe on on Saturday I would show how to use them. Yeah, some of us already saw earlier. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, that's all. The question was also about things that you know the AI should focus on or focuses now. I think one of the challenges is um, to make our make the algorithms um, more robust. I mean, uh, 
imagine a situation when you are driving a self-driving car and it uses AI you know, to, uh, to make a decision to stop, to brake or to accelerate. And then someone paints something on the wall, like you know, messing up a couple of pixels, and that's enough to convince your car to accelerate even there is a red light and there are cars passing by. It's enough. And there have been examples of, you know, a picture of a cat that, and uh, the AI tells that this is a dog and this is some of the, of the tricks that is a huge challenge to, you know, to train a neural network that will change the image in a way that the people cannot tell the difference, but that it will confuse another AI. On this small piece, I mean, like, the question was, like, really open, so now we just, like, keep going in rounds. Um, since, like, it's getting, like, more common, right, and we're using, like, more data, and it's getting, like, easier to run that, right, now it's also getting, like, all about data, basically, right? And what is also happening right now, quite a big topic, is, like, how biased and how fair is your data is, right? So, essentially, if your images are collected from, like, Western world, right, you also, like, are represented for, like, many of, you know, like, other countries and other things. The same goes for genders, the same goes for races. So I think, uh, like, on one hand, trying to, you know, be able to understand why decisions are made in your super, like, a deep neural networks or whatever else, like, one problem. And on the other hand, like, is basically trying to see that your data is, like, ethically correct and, like, fair, basically, because you're making decisions based on this data. So if your data is crap, basically, you're receiving the same decisions. And, I mean, I just need to mention that. Yeah, great. So I actually was going to follow up with this question, so nice one, good job getting in front of it. Uh, and I think just to, to, to pile on this is that um, explainability is going to be a big factor that is going to decide whether AI gets adopted on en masse or not. Um, I mean, look at what's happening in China, for example, where they basically run a kind of social credit score for each individual uh, that... Um, basically rewards specific actions like paying your uh, loans or being a good citizen or things like that and punishes others and the system is completely opaque. Uh, I mean the West... Completely opaque to the usual people. To the normal people, yes. exactly. I mean, think about it this way. So uh, for a long time in the Western world we had, if you want to go to a bank and get a, a loan, uh, the bank would run uh, a sort of credit check and they would come up with something that's called a FICO score in the US. Basically, they would score you based on your credit worthiness, right, on your credit worthiness. And nobody would explain to you, for example, if you went to a, a bank to get a loan and you would get denied, nobody would tell you, well, you got denied because of that on that or the other reason. And that was kind of accepted since banks were private institutions. I mean, they didn't really have, at that point, they didn't have to explain the reasoning behind the decisions. But when governments do it, and governments are supposed to be working for us, not for profit, uh, then the question becomes a lot more stringent and it really needs an answer. And, uh, yeah. Wouldn't that be like similar to the corporate thing? Uh, I don't know. So it's, it's not necessarily, yeah, so you get what you incentivize. So basically, uh, people in China have started to kind of experiment with the environment and figure out how to uh, maximize the score. But the, ba the main problem is that Nobody would explain to you, so the government, basically, not nobody, so the government won't explain to you why you were rewarded or punished or got on whatever, right? because it's China, okay? China's not a democracy, let's get rid of it. But things, things like that may decide to come here, right? You've seen things about the US military trying to use AI in weapons and the whole ethical debate about that. Is that most, most of their problems with AI, the US military, if you read their uh, report is that expandability is the number one issue. Okay, so um, yeah, this is uh, this is an area that will really need to become a lot better to you know the, to for AI to get more generally accepted. Next year you will see a bunch of Chinese people you know. Next year you may uh, see a bunch of Chinese people crossing the road this way and another you know to bump their score because they're crossing on the green line, not the red one. Okay, so another question. Uh, let's go. Let's <laughs> Hello, uh, I have a question regarding uh, research. Uh, what do you think is the current uh, state of the art of reinforcement learning into planning? 
And the two examples are uh, reinforcement learning agent playing a complex game like StarCraft and beating a player. And the autonomous driving car uh, is able to travel from one city to another without any inter human intervention. I think it's a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. You guys have a panel, so if you guys want to go in front, then no, no, no. <laughs> so, okay, so like, like we said, uh, like you mentioned, and we, we will also mentioned Go being like the hardest easy problem, is that so far most of the successes of reinforcement learning have been applied to problems where uh, usually the state is as much as close to fully observable as possible. So in Go, you will always see the full board in front of you, like just the same, right? Uh, there is discrete time steps, so there is not a problem of continuous control. Uh, as far as I know, I'm not actually uh, working in uh, uh, autonomous driving, I'm not in that field, maybe some, some of you are, right? But that's not just a reinforcement learning problem, right? It's a kind of combination of multiple ones. Um, so, yeah, there is, there is a new, uh, there is another step to be, to be taken in this, in this regard. Uh, one other issue, that, one other thing that uh, kind of the reinforcement learning community has uh, figured out is that while it's very, very cool to learn from scratch, uh, so basically doing pure reinforcement learning like AlphaGo Zero, uh, it's extremely sample inefficient. So it takes you a ton of experience, basically accumulating a lot of experience in order to be able to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to get to a level where you would probably be better off using some sort of uh, pre, pre, uh, I don't know, pre-trained knowledge if you want, right, in forms of maybe heuristics or some other stuff, and start from there. Okay, so learning from scratch is fun, but it has its own set of challenges. The other thing is that, like I said, there is a cost to learning. So if you think about almost autonomous driving, like, like he said, right, if you, if you make a mistake, you may actually end up killing someone if you do it in real life. So a lot of the stuff is being done in simulators. <coughs> so you actually ask about planning. Uh, what kind of, like, like logistics or some? Make a sequence of decisions into each group. <coughs> Making a sequence of decisions. OK, so a sequence of decisions to reaching a specific goal. Yeah, indeed. Like strategic planning. Uh, strategic planning, exactly. OK. Uh, so there is one paper, and I'm going to like post the link somehow, I don't know. You guys want to add something? Yeah. I think you have to. You have to consider one thing that uh, in reinforced learning. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, the rules are somehow known. They are not changing over time, and it's not something like that you can in real world scenarios, especially if uh, your decisions are influenced by decisions of other people. So it's not that easy to you know to come up with something like that because the other people may change the rules of the game as they want. They may not. They may at least try not to follow the same rules you are trying to use in you know, order to come up with the optimal solution because they can simply try to cheat. And I have seen recently a pretty uh, nice uh, video where the guys were using uh, a computer mouse to inject some uh, assembly into the game so they can uh, look for the walls and this kind of stuff so and for this kind of challenges I think human for at least some time will be better unless computer learns how to be a very prick so. so to summarize the, the type of problems that reinforcement learning is uh, better suited at solving is those that uh, maybe the uh, process itself is not stochastic. So it's first it's as close to fully observable as possible. Then it um, doesn't really have too much randomness into it, right? And crucially, you're able to build a simulator that is able to simulate that process as close to the real thing as possible. So you're able to train uh, using reinforcement learning, which again is kind of sample inefficient. So there is there's going to be a lot of failure doing that. So for example, in, in, uh, in terms like in uh, industries like manufacturing or oil and gas, uh, there is this concept of digital twin. So maybe you have like, a, I don't know, a refinery and you have some sort of fractionator that separates oils and from other types of fluids, 
uh, you're not going to do reinforcement learning on the real thing, right? So you need something that simulates those processes as close to real thing as possible. So for example, these types of industries have had those for a while, and they are now just realizing that they can start to use this kind of thing, right? So whatever type of process you're trying to use or trying to learn, uh, it's really useful if you actually have a sort of uh, simulator that's close, as close to the real thing as possible. And decision systems like strategic planning, I'm not sure it really fits into that, to be honest, at least right now. I think also like a small addition. So even like a, you know, if rules are uh, static, right, and are changing, in many cases we are pretty bad at like long horizon of planning, right? So if you look at the Dota games that they had, like one of the latest ones, right, it was pretty good in the beginning, right? But once the game was running like for longer, it's kind of like uh, you know faded out basically to nowhere. So um, I think even there, even if rules are static, it's still not that good basically. So we're good at in the beginning, as it's all what you were talking about, also like oversampling, so you know what are the cases, how to learn it, right? But once you're like progressing, the amount of data that you have and how to make the decisions getting like less and less basically, and you're just getting like better at guessing basically, not that uh, predicting. Um, maybe one more example from the banking industry. So maybe the classic use case of reinforced learning. Actually, it's not reinforced learning at all, but it's kind of because you cannot imagine a situation when a bank is giving mortgages just you know for everyone to gain the knowledge about the market. Actually, they used to do it some time ago, but they do not do it anymore for like you know like 100 years or something. But anyway. Uh, there is a procedure that is called reject inference. So you basically take your model, you take the people that have been rejected uh, a mortgage for various reasons, maybe some business rules, whatever. You run them through this model and you give uh, the mortgages to all that passed, plus 10% of those that didn't. Like, you know, you're not giving the mortgages for every month, but you know, you want to have a uh, fresh look over your population, something like that, and actually it boosts the income, so so it works. Okay, so we'll take one more question because it's already quite late. Yeah, I have a question. Um, will AI and machine learning uh, be able to replace programmers and developers? That already does. Okay. Actually, you can find uh, pretty nice examples on the web. Uh, first of all, if you have a recurrent neural network, you can and you fit it with Linux sources, it, it will generate uh, C++ code. Maybe it won't compile, and it won't make sense, but it at least can learn the syntax itself, just out of this. And you can find a couple of examples over the internet where you actually uh, create an image of a website, for example, so you have you know the text, you have something, you and you fit uh, this uh, this image plus the code of the website. I mean the HTML code, the CSS, all this kind of stuff to a neural network. Next, you give it another image and it generates the code for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean uh, more complex successfully replacing the programmers. People are already working on that to some extent, and I think in maybe not in two years or five years, but eventually I think at least some of the codes, uh, at least some of the parts will be replaced and will end up with a Star Trek, let's, you know, computer do this, do that, run, run the simulations, but when something breaks, you will need a real clever guy to fix it up. Uh, this is one maybe easier fruit to pick here, unit and acceptance test, automated tests. I recently read about an experiment of some guys who created an AI which was a persona on GitHub and I don't like microphones. <laughs> um, and it tried to fix or find bugs and fix write code for the bugs that were uh, reported by the CI CD pipeline. And it filed pull requests and merged those pull requests into the development branch and fixed some of the code, the broken code. So that's the most recent advance in replacing or writing code or bug fixes as a developer. And most of the people who reviewed those pull requests didn't uh, manage to 
detect that it was a robot. That's what I read two days ago. Yeah, features here already. So, like, I think complex stuff, no. Just like if you're interested about uh, code and machine learning, right, they're starting to show up like a new almost, it's not industry, but this direction. So, ML on code, or like code on ML, like whatever direction you would go. And there's like a bunch of people that are trying to analyze and maybe like suggest things and also do semantically understanding of your code, basically. So, there's a bunch of startups. And uh, I think FOSDEM also going to have like a special room of words that is all this year. Uh, open source conference. So if you're interested, just go there. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, no again. <laughs> yeah, so there's pizzas outside. Uh, help yourselves, enjoy it, and see you next time.